What's going on, everyone? This is the Fantasy Playbook Podcast. My name is Kyle Yates, and I am your host. I can be found on Twitter at KyleYNFL. I am joined today by Adam Murphit of Five Yard Rush. You can be found on Twitter at Murph underscore NFL. Murph, how are we doing today? Actually, I've got a question on top of how are you doing. It's hot as hell, man. Literally, like hot as hell here in the U.S. right now. What is your go-to summer beverage? Doesn't have to be alcoholic, but go-to summer beverage when it gets super hot outside. Well, I'm doing really well, and actually, it's really hot here. And we don't. So unlike the U.S., we don't have air conditioning anywhere, except for like oh. in a few shops and stuff. So our houses don't have air conditioning. So I've already had to take like an extra shower today because it's <laughs> it is hot here um, as well. Uh, beverages. Listen, I've got two. I'm going to cheat because I can't. I can't pivot from the two. Um, we have a drink here. I'm not sure it's in the States. If it is, I don't think it's all that common. Um, called Pims. Um, it's a really nice, like, alcoholic beverage that you mix with lemonade and then you put a load of a load of fruit in it. So you put like a load of um like apples and strawberries and cherries and all that sort of stuff, and you, you have it in like huge jugs, and you just have jugs of pims on the go. So it's it's a bit like a sangria, but a bit sweeter. Um, okay. kind of that kind of look and feel of, of like how it would be served and what it's like. It's a bit like that, but it's a pure spirit as opposed to a wine um, and a, and a little bit sweeter. So uh, yeah, that's a go-to as a nice summer drink. Um, and also a pint of cider. You can't beat cider, really good pint of cider, a little bit of ice in there. Some people might not like that take, but <laughs> given it's summer, you've got to have an extra cold. So right. I always think, uh, English cider in, in the summer sun is uh, is a privilege. I always think Guinness is winter and is your winter blanket. Cider is your summer drink. All right. So as soon as this podcast is done, I'm going to do a Google search for PIMS in the US and see if I can find some because that sounds right up my alley, man. Uh, right now, currently for me, like Costco, I, I don't think that you have Costco over there. Yeah, but we have Costco. Costco. Oh, you have Costco. Over the, okay. All right. Yeah, so Costco, Costco the Kirkland margarita mix. Woo, that is hitting oh. different here in the summer months. That is something where uh, we have to say for my like almost four year old now, like he all the time is like, can I have that? And it's like, this is this is daddy juice, buddy. You you wouldn't like this. This <laughs> it's spicy. It, it's spicy. You wouldn't like this. But no, that is hitting different here in the summer months. And again, it's like 95, like 90 percent humidity here. It is absolutely Ooh terrible it's brutal right now so staying inside we do have the air conditioning not to brag got the air conditioning running right now it's nice all right here we go so let's get into the topic for today uh before we get into all that though i want to do this periodically on the show here reading some reviews that are coming in i talk about all the time how important the ratings and reviews for the podcast are so what i want to do is read some of these from time to time if you leave a review you might be able to get it on the show here. I read every single one that comes through, right? Even the ones that have the constructive criticism, the negative feedback, the things that I can be working on here to help form and shape the show is we're still kind of getting off the ground running here. So what I want to do, highlight one that came in here from Blackblade1981. Been listening to Yates for years now, and when I heard he had ventured out on his own, I immediately knew I needed to add this show to my listening schedule. It doesn't disappoint. The show is entertaining and informative. This will make you a better fantasy player and give you something fun to look forward to. Keep up the good work, Yates. Blackblade1981, thank you, thank you, thank you for the reviews. For everyone else who has left a review already, thank you so much. Again, they help the show in a way that you just cannot possibly imagine. So thank you guys. If you're listening to this, I encourage you to take 30 seconds out of your day, leave a rating and review for the show wherever you are listening. Also, before we get into talking some wide receiver and quarterback breakouts here, I want to say the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the fantasy playbook here. June 1st, we crossed over 4,000 YouTube subscribers. We are closing in right now on 4,600. In just a few days, we're going to be pushing towards 5,000 YouTube subscribers. Absolutely insane. So join in on the fun there, youtube.com slash the fantasy playbook. You can watch this podcast here. You can see Murph's face. You can see mine. We've got some new layouts some new graphics here on the YouTube channel as well. So make sure to check that out. Hit the like button if you're watching there as well and subscribe to the YouTube channel helps out in a big way. All right, Murph, let's get into the conversation here today. Taking a look at these wide receiver breakout candidates, the players that, and like people are going, depending on who you ask, defining a breakout has so many different meanings, right? But the players that we believe are going to over or outperform expectations. The guys who are going to take another step in their career. So let's take a look here. Your first wide receiver that you're expecting to outperform expectations here in 2022. Yeah. And my first one is 
he, he is going to cost you uh, quite a lot this year. His value has gone through the roof, but I still think even at where he's been taken in drafts, he is still a, a value of some degree, and that's C.D. Lamb. He's currently coming off the board, so that wide receiver eight, wide receiver nine, I really think he's going to finish in the top five this year. Look at his finishes. He was wide receiver 19 last season, wide receiver 22 in uh, 2020, but with Amari Cooper and Cedric Wilson leaving town, there's 181 vacated wide receiver targets. They've not replaced these guys. You know, they fully believe that CD Lamb is going to be the number one there. 44% of the vacated targets inside the 10 have gone out the door with Amari Cooper and Cedric Wilson. There's a lot of opportunity here for CD Lamb. And also, the thing with CD Lamb, He's only on the field 76% of the time in 2021. That is going to change. He's going to be pushing nearly 90% of snap plays. No gallop at the start of the season as well. He's going to be an absolute target monster. He's going to just have an absolutely huge year. I mean, he's already shown how good he is as a receiver. 13th in yards per uh, yards per route run, according to PFF. Fifth in missed tackles, forced by wide receivers. He's seventh in average yards uh, after the catch, above expectation. He's got huge PFF grades. I mean, this guy literally has everything. He only got 120 targets last year. He's definitely going to get another 50, 60 more this year. I think he's an absolute value and unlock in the top five right now. I absolutely love the call here. Just on yesterday's podcast with Derek Brown, I talked about C.D. Lamb as an early round value, in my opinion, even going in the second round, right? A player in that territory that I believe is a value because – I do think top five is in the range of outcomes here for CD Lamb this year. And here's the thing that I didn't even mention on yesterday's podcast, but it just occurred to me too. This defense was performing at an incredible level mm -hmm. last year, right? And I don't necessarily believe that we can kind of like we see defenses ebb and flow, right? Unless you are mm -hmm. just an all pro defense across the board, like you're going to ebb and flow. You're not going to be top five one year and then remain in the top five the next year. Those kind of, the, yeah, the, it doesn't happen. Those dip and, and ebb and flow. So I think we could expect to see the Dallas defense take a step backwards this year. And that led to the Dallas defense being a top five unit last year led to a decreased pass attempts for Dak mm. Prescott. Well, if we see that defense take a step backwards, we see the pass attempts tick up. There's a direct correlation typically between the two of those. That means even more volume for CD lamb as the wide receiver one. No one else is pushing that wide receiver one territory, that wide receiver one crown from C.D. Lamb this year. So I absolutely love the call. think that he is in line for a massive year here and someone that definitely, I mean, he's performed well through the first two years of his yeah. career, but can absolutely take another massive step forward. For me, yeah. I'm going to highlight, oh, do you have anything to add there with uh, with? Well, I, I think the other thing you've got to remember is he plays in probably the worst division in football outside of the, <laughs> the NFC North. So, you know, he's got six games there he can really go to town on and, Defensive coverage is in the, in in, the, in that division is poor. He's going to get some really favorable matchups. He's excellent in contested catch situations. He's going to he's going to eat this year. It's just going to be really exciting. I I I was in love with him in, in college. I thought he was probably the best route runner uh, in his class. Um, the, the I mean the Cowboys got so lucky to get him at seventeen, in my opinion. Right. And uh, yeah, I think he's I just can't wait to see it because he's going to put a clinic on this year. And it's, I'm going to be interested to see where his ADP kind of stays because mm -hmm. we've been talking about C.D. Lamb the past couple of years. We've been hyping him up and saying, all right, this is a guy that you definitely want to draft. And now he hasn't disappointed. You mentioned like wide receiver in the 18 to 22 19. range, right? Like in that range, that's still pretty good. But that hasn't met the expectations of where we drafted him last year, right? Or the year prior. Mm -hmm. So it's someone where I think that there's going to be a lot of fantasy managers that are seeing the name and go, well, I've drafted this guy before. I've heard this narrative. No, everything is lining up for CD Lamb to have a massive year. All right. For me, the first wide receiver that I'm going to talk about here is Ron Dale Moore, the wide receiver for the Arizona Cardinals. Now, for anyone who hyped up Rondale Moore last year, the first two weeks of the season, you were doing the greatest victory laps in the history of fantasy football, right? Through the first two weeks of last season, Moore was a top 20 fantasy wide receiver. It looked like this was going to be a league winner where you drafted Rondale Moore. And then it absolutely fell off a cliff, man. It went downhill real quick. It went downhill real quick. And I remember in like week five, week six, I was still getting questions about, should I be starting Rondell Moore in my lineup this week? Right. Even though he was getting like two fantasy points, three fantasy points. He was not playing more than like 20 to 30% of the snaps. And that is going to, it's a very similar thing to CD Lamb in the narrative that we create as fantasy managers. 
where we had this expectation. We had the the hype surrounding a player and he didn't live up to it. He burned fantasy managers last year by Cliff Kingsbury, not putting him on the field more, mm -hmm. but I mean, you had Christian Kirk there in the slot, right? Where was Rondale Moore going to play outside of a gadget type role? And that's very unreliable from a fantasy perspective. Now you look forward to 2022, Christian Kirk is gone. We know he got massively overpaid in Jacksonville. So now you have Rondale Moore as the starting slot receiver for an offense that has proven to be able to put up massive points, right? It's a very fantasy friendly offense. Marquise Brown in town, DeAndre Hopkins also there, but suspended the first six weeks of the season. For a player who is going off the board right now as wide receiver 59 in ADP consensus over on Fantasy Pros, you're looking for the guys who are going to hit right away. The players mm -hmm. that are going to be able to return value right away, other, so that way you know what you have. Otherwise, you're simply going to cut them, you're going to move on. Rondale Moore, with DeAndre Hopkins out the first six weeks of the season, is going to see a ton of targets, a ton of opportunity here. And what has been happening this offseason? Cliff Kingsbury, every opportunity he gets to talk about Rondale Moore playing more, taking another step forward this year. He's absolutely hyping up Rondale Moore this year, says that he's going to be a big part of the offense. So I am absolutely looking at Rondale Moore to take that next step forward in his career this year. We saw flashes of it. We saw the potential last year, just didn't get the consistent playing time. I think that's all going to change here this year. Any thoughts on Rondale Moore before we move on to your second wide receiver? No, I love it. For someone you're going to get for essentially free in drafts, anytime you're picking in the late 10th round, even if it doesn't work, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, you're going to replace these guys if it doesn't pan out. It's no risk to take Rondale Moore in drafts this year. And I completely agree with you. You look at the fact that Kirk is gone, the fact that there is that suspension. You know, so people are going to say, well, Marquis Holly Brown's come in. Yeah, but he's a, he's a, he's a jetter. He's outside. He's going to fly past. His role is not in the slot. They need a huge target volume. It's not a player. It's, that player is, is Rondale Moore. There isn't anyone else on the roster right now who is going to compete for those touches. It's not going to be Zach Hurts. It's certainly not going to be Trey McBride. You know, right. they, they're going to have roles. Absolutely. Yep. Um, I think the only thing that's going to stop Rondell Moore is, it, and the only interesting thing is, is what happens when Hopkins comes back and they sort of right. reshuffle the lines a little bit. But I think right. even then, you can get Rondell Moore in the 11th round. Even if you get right. six great weeks out of him to start and he mm -hmm. makes that case, you know, if it doesn't work out, like I said, you're not paying anything for him. You know, what are you going to take there? A handcuff for a running back? And if that doesn't pan out, you're going to drop him anyway. Right. So I think uh, it's he is one of those players that if it all breaks right, he's a top 20 player. It can happen. You know, that is in his range of outcomes this year because, as you say, he's being hyped up. He's got no challenge to that role right now. It's his to lose in the first six weeks of the season. And, I, yeah, I love the call here. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting too because you can see that the path to be able to trade Rondale more right? Like if it doesn't happen right away, or uh, I'm sorry, if it does happen right away, and then as DeAndre Hopkins is getting close to come returning, you could just trade Rondell Moore for a greater price than the wide receiver 59 and what you drafted him, right? Because he's going to hit right away. So those are the type of players that I'm looking to invest in later on in my draft. All right, let's turn it back over to you, your second wide receiver that you believe is going to take a step forward this year. So he's going a little bit earlier than Rondell Moore, but not that much earlier. He's going at wide receiver 49 right now, and that's Russell Gage. I think Russell Gage is probably the greatest value in, in drafts right now because I cannot believe you can get a guy who has wide receiver two, not just upside, it's quite a reasonable outcome to expect from him. And you're getting him at wide receiver 49 in the ninth or 10th round. It's absolutely nuts. He's going to go into that AB role that we've seen. Now, AB played 15 regular season games in that role. Um, in that, and, I, and again, I'm not saying Russell Gage is, is Antonio Brown, but in that style of role, 15 games, AB got 124 targets, 87 catches, 1,028 yards, and eight touchdowns. That stat line is good and was good, good enough for the wide receiver 18 last year. And again, that's 15 games over two seasons. We're talking about an easier schedule for, uh, for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this year, but they also have those vacated targets because – not only is AB not on the team, Gronk, and he'll come back, but he's not going to get the same workload that he's had the last couple of years. So 190 vacated targets is currently on the team. Not to mention you've got Chris Godwin, who's not going to play probably before October. Let's say end of September is like the best case scenario. So right. we're looking at three, four games where he's going to walk in and he's easily going to see significant targets. I, I think for me, I'm looking at the projections right now. 
I've got Gage somewhere between in his outcome, somewhere between 110 and 125 targets. Because they there isn't going to be, you know, there's no one that's going to play that role. And they paid him a lot of money. You know, he got mm-hmm. he got 10 they mil did. a year for three years. We're not talking about a guy they've bought off the streets. And people who have been a bit disappointed in Russell Gage, you know, he was on a terrible offense last year. In weeks 13 through 18, he had 500 receiving yards, which was good for seventh amongst all wide receivers. He actually burned the Bucks for 130 yards in week right. 13 last year. And that, that was his audition, right? That's what he right. That was where Tom game. Brady was like, that guy. Let's get that guy. <laughs> Let's get that guy. Because 13 catches, 100. And, you know, for me, Russell Gage is going to get a lot of these 8 for 80 stat lines. That's kind of what we're going to see. We're not going to see huge 150, 160-yard games. But eight for eighty is still sixteen PPR points, which you're getting at the at the wide receiver forty nine. There's no guy in that range or afterwards. He's going to be a really consistent player. You know, he's not going to have a lot of game winning weeks, but he's going to have a lot of those eight for eighty weeks where he's just going to be sixteen points, fifteen points, sixteen points, seventeen points. He's going to knock around that fourteen to twenty mark most weeks. I'd love that. Those are the guys that win your championships. It's not the guys that put up 50 points and then five points. Right. It's those guys who consistently put up points. There's no better value for me anywhere in the draft than Russell Gage right now. It's a very similar narrative to what we just talked about with Rondale yeah. Moore, right? The suspension for DeAndre Hopkins correlates to the injury for Chris Godwin, right? If Chris Godwin lands on the pup, you're talking about six, seven weeks of Russell Gage being a massive contributor for fantasy purposes in an offense that threw the ball 719 times last year right this is an offense that just loves to throw the ball Tom Brady wants the ball in his hands and right now you got Mike Evans who has never really been a target hog right he makes his mark for in touchdowns so where's the ball gonna go and Russell Gage stands to benefit immediately this season right away and again I mentioned it after once you get past round eight round seven whatever you're looking for the players who can hit right away the players who you know what you're gonna have Yeah, we have questions when Chris Godwin returns to the lineup. What's the overall volume going to be there for Gage? But, I mean, he bumps down to, what, a flex play at worst, right? When you have the passing volume there for all three of these guys to really feast, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, and Russell Gage, and the passing volume is there, all three can still be very, very reliable fantasy options. We saw that last year with Evans, Godwin, and AB on the field at the same time. All right, I'm going to go here for the second wide receiver. I'm going to go with Joshua Palmer, the wide receiver for the Los Angeles Chargers. There were two games last year where Palmer played more than 80% of the snaps in the offense, weeks 14 and 16. He finished with 15.1 and 12.8 half PPR points in those two weeks. Now, it's important to note that week 14 was without Allen in the lineup and week 16 was without Williams. So he was the wide receiver too in that time in those two games. But the benefit this year is that he brings versatility, right? He had 38.9% of his snaps out of the slot last year, 60.2% of his snaps out wide. So he was able to move around the formation. He was not just one of the guys who's immediately behind Mike Williams in the depth chart. And like when Williams goes down, then Palmer comes in. No, he can really move around the formation and be a versatile chess piece. Current news is that he's starting over Jalen Guyton in uh, Chargers minicamp practices. So if we now move from Joshua Palmer being a high upside backup, someone that is going to step in when Mike Williams gets injured, not if Mike Williams gets injured, but when Mike Williams misses time with an injury, then you look at Palmer as a guy who you want to get off the waiver wire immediately. You're going to spend a lot in fab to get him. No, this is a guy who might be a starting option in one of the league's best offenses with Justin Herbert in year two, right? In year two of this system, we could see Herbert take an even bigger step forward And Palmer's going to be a main beneficiary of that. So one of the guys right now that is just absolutely slept on in drafts, we're starting to see news that Jalen Guyton is not going to be the the field stretcher role, right? That guy who fills a very valuable role for the offense can open things up, but it's going to be Palmer there as that starting wide receiver alongside Allen and Williams. So if you can get Palmer as the guy who might bring kind of very similar to Russell Gage, a flex play most weeks, he's going to see Mm -hmm. enough volume to be in that territory but then insane, insane upside. If when Mike Williams goes down with an injury, if Keenan Allen misses time, we know that he can slide into either one of those roles. Those are the types of guys that I'm looking to invest in later on in my draft. All right, let's turn it back over to you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, agree. And and the other one is don't forget, you know, Austin Eckler is also someone who gets injuries. You know, he's someone who has missed significant time. And then again, that's that's targets that, you know, Palmer is likely to get because they're not going to pump much more 
to Keenan Allen. He's already getting huge, huge right, workload. Right. You might get an extra 10 or so targets. Mike Williams, again, when he hits that kind of workload, he tends to either go missing or hurt something, and he always tends to go down. Yeah, I, I love it. I think Josh Palmer, people forget the draft capital that's in him as well. You know, he was taken pretty right. pretty high up in the in the NFL draft. They like this guy, and it's no surprise he's gonna he's gonna finish ahead of or he's gonna be on the depth chart ahead of Guyton. I think it's just a case of when right. the I think the only thing I would say is you might have to be a little bit patient with Palmer. I don't, right? unlike everyone else we said, I don't think week one, week two, you're going to see the best out of Josh Palmer. I think it is going to mm-hmm. take a little bit of time, but I think if you can if you can wait till the bye week start and wait and see, I think you'll be really pleasantly surprised what comes his way. And the ADP will reflect that, right? The 100%. ADP will be, you know, will afford the ability to be able to wait. It's not like he's going to go in the sixth round of redrafts okay. this year, right? Or anything like that where you have to take him and then suddenly you're getting impatient because he's not producing. No, he'll be there in the 13th, 14th round for you. All right, let's go wide to your third 70. breakout <laughs> wide receiver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Third breakout wide receiver, Murph. Where are we going? Um, uh, we're going with... with- one of my favorite players from the second end of, uh, of back end of last season, it's Gabriel Davis uh, out of my alma mater. The, this uh, is University my guy. This Central is my Hall third. This Knights. is my third breakout wide receiver as well. So let's spend some time talking about Gabriel Davis. I love it. Uh, I love Gabriel Davis. There's just for me again, not just the fact that he went to my alma mater, but again, you're talking about, and you've seen a common theme with all of my picks. Buffalo, 184 vacated wide receiver targets. A lot of those went out the door with Cole Beasley. Appreciate it's a slightly different role. But Davis averaged in his last six games 19.8 PPR points per game. And he had finishes with the wide receiver 30, wide receiver 26, and the wide receiver 4. And he had a full complement. Beasley was still playing. He was in those games. In fact, one of the games where um, Gabriel Davis was wide receiver 30, Beasley was wide receiver 25. So we're talking about a player who, again, has put up good numbers, just hasn't done it consistently over a season. But now with Beasley gone, there is a clear wide receiver two role there. It's going to go to Davis. It's no doubt in my mind. That right. Don't worry about Jameson Crowder coming in. Gabriel yep. Davis is going to have this role. Look at his PFF grades. His PFF grades for catches over 20 yards is better than CeeDee Lamb's. 98.5. You know, he's 99 in that intermediate role, which, again, is almost as good as C.D. Lamb. And last season, he caught six touchdowns off just 35 receptions. I mean, he had insane efficiency. Again, that's probably going to go out of whack. But he only had 61 targets last season. And there's an easy path to seeing him getting 100 or so targets this year. If that happens, he already put up 575 yards. You're nearly doubling his target share. He's going to have... You know, easily a thousand yards, maybe somewhere in that region of six to ten touchdowns. He's going to have an absolutely great year on a really high powered offense. And he's going off the board very cheaply for someone who is a wide receiver, too, off one of the best offenses in the NFL. Yep. I have been talking about Gabriel Davis, I mean, it, since March, right? This is a guy that I have been yeah. pumping up from a dynasty perspective, saying, like, get this guy right now because he, you are not going to be able to acquire this guy you know, just a few months down the line. And whenever I have talked about Gabriel Davis on Twitter, the pushback has been, well, he didn't, you know, he, he was buried on the depth chart last year behind Emmanuel Sanders and Cole Beasley, right? He wasn't a full-time starter. That's been the pushback. And I think that the, what's at the heart of the concern over Davis. So I wanted to, I was like, I could talk about Gabriel Davis and I could point out a ton of different stats, right? And the stats are there, like you just mentioned, which I think is perfect. Like we complement each other in our arguments here with Gabriel Davis. I could talk about that, right? But the, the stats are all there to illustrate how good Davis is. But I wanted to get to the heart of what people are concerned about Davis with. And I was thinking about Davis the other day and Hunter Renfro came to my mind, right? And mm-hmm. you're going to be like, what, what are you talking about? Well, looking at Renfro over the first two years of his career, In his rookie season, he showed flashes. He showed the potential that we saw at Clemson to be a solid, you know, slot receiver in the NFL. In his rookie season, Renfro played 435 total snaps on the season. So then you go into the sophomore year and you say, all right, this guy should deserve some more playing time, right? A guy who we saw the flashes, we saw the potential. He only saw a slight bump up to 554 snaps. He was playing behind Nelson Aguilar and Henry Ruggs, right? And I understand different roles in the offense. You have the two wide receiver sets. I get it. But it's Nelson Aguilar that you were rolling out there over Hunter Renfro. This is just to illustrate NFL coaches do weird things sometimes. 
in, with players that we do not, what we think deserve a better opportunity, they sometimes don't get it. They don't get the opportunity that they deserve. Instead, they're going to roll with veteran players who they think fill the needs for their offense, the sp specific roles that they have, right? And that's kind of what I think we saw last year with Emmanuel Sanders and Cole Beasley over Gabriel Davis, even though we saw the potential, we saw the flashes in his rookie season. Gabriel Davis, over the first two years of his career on very limited opportunity, has 18 total touchdowns. 18 total touchdowns over the first two years of his career. Now you're telling me that he's going to jump up to a 80% snap guy, a guy who's going to be the touchdown op, you know, option for Josh Allen in the league's best offense. And this is a guy who I think is going to take a massive step forward this year. We're seeing the buzz coming out from mini camps, from OTAs, that Davis is the clear number two option. He's in line for a massive year. This is a guy that I would love to get on my roster as a wide receiver too. If I can get him as a wide receiver three, sometimes even a wide receiver four in drafts currently, that's something I'm soaking up every single second of the day. Anything to add there with Davis before we move on? The last one is his contested catch rate is absolutely nuts. This guy always comes down with the ball. His contested catch rate last season was almost 75%. To put that in perspective... <laughs> That was better than C.D. Lamb, who we've just praised as one of the best contested catch guys. You know, it was better than Mike Evans, who is known as one of the best right. red zone guys. You know, we're talking about a guy who last season showed elite levels of contested catch ability. Whenever it was up there, he got the ball. And his contested catch rate consistently last season was a lot better than Stefan Diggs. In tight windows and tight opportunities in right. the red zone, they're not going to Diggs. They're going to Davis. Davis is going to be this guy who's going to get anywhere between six to 10 plus touchdowns, the opportunities there, and also to buy the second wide receiver or in the Buffalo Bills, a great NFL offense right. in the seventh, eighth round. Like, it's a no brainer. Like, it's a. What are we doing here? No exactly. <laughs> Why he's got to go up in price at some point. It's going right. to be. When he's announced as the wide receiver too, and this is why your point right. on dynasty is key. I've been sweeping up Gabriel Davis for second round picks yep. in 2023 all off season. Yep. <laughs> I, think I, I think I've almost managed to get Davis on every single one of my dynasty rosters there we go. for this reason because of the fact that right now that role isn't there. As soon as it's announced, you're not getting him. It's his, right. his price will go up sixth round, maybe even fifth round because people will yep. start to go, Oh, yeah, that Davis, he was the guy who had that massive week at the end of the season in the fantasy playoffs. Right. Like, people will start to click. So take advantage now while you can. Yep, absolutely. All right, let's move on to the quarterbacks here. And talking about breakout quarterbacks, I think there is an obvious name here, but I'm interested to see where you go, Murph. Breakout quarterback, what are we thinking? You should, you should know the answer to this one because I came on the Fantasy Pros podcast for you last year and I talked about a league-winning podcast, uh, a league-winning quarterback um and i'm going to talk about him again because his adp is ridiculous um it's going to be tom brady i don't understand tom brady's adp i, I can't call him a breakout given he's the greatest player right. of all time <laughs> but for his adp i don't understand this why is it every single year people get into their heads that they need to overthink tom brady um he's going off the board right now uh, I saw a couple of days ago he was going off at QB 10. He's okay. So he's risen to QB 9. I don't, don't get that. He's going off the board at like 87 overall, which is 7th, 8th round. It just doesn't make any sense. Last season, he was the QB 3. He was the QB 3. I said on the Fantasy Pros podcast last year, he was going to finish top 5. I said he'd throw for almost 5,000 yards. He even blew my uh, prediction well out of the water there. Yeah, but the key thing with Brady is last season. So I, I do in the, the <laughs> stealing the name, the fantasy football playbook. Um, I look at elite consistency. So elite consistency uh, across for like what I call an MVP week, which is a, a top five QB week. I set that line looking at all the scoring last year at 24 and a half points. So anytime a quarterback scored 24 and a half points, they'd get uh, considered an MVP week. Brady had 10 of those last year. So 10 times yeah. he scored over 24 and a half points in fantasy football. The next best was Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, and Dak Prescott. They had seven. So he, he, it wasn't like it was close. He blew these guys out of the water for game winning weeks. And nothing's changed. He's lost Antonio Brown. He's got Russell Gage. That doesn't right. change anything. Gronk's going to come back. 
He's got Fournette. Rojo's not a factor. He didn't need to worry about him leaving the door. Like everything is just as it was for Tom Brady. And people can talk about Arians going. Let me tell you, this is going to be the best thing for Tom Brady because now that resistance that he was probably getting from uh, Bruce Arians, where Bruce Arians wanted to put his style and his offense, Brady's not going to get that. Brady's going to do things the way he wants to right. do it. It's going to be his right. offense this year right. because they're just going to allow him to do what he wants. <laughs> Right. I, say, I wrote up the, I wrote up the other day, Murph. I was like, Tom Brady, like it, you know, we have questions about who the play caller is. No, we don't. The play caller is Tom Brady. This is Tom his Brady. offense. He's going to do what he wants. You know, he threw for 5,300 yards last year, you know, even with a 10% reduction, let's say that father time catches up and he loses 10% of that. He's still throwing for 4,800. Who else yep. is going to throw for near enough 5,000 yards and 40 TDs? Maybe Justin Herbert is the only one that's going to come close to catching him in that area. So you can write him in, you can write him in pen, the top five. I think he's going to go top three again. Uh, I, there's no doubt in my mind that Tom Brady's going to be a top five, if not a top three QB this year. And I think you're getting him in the seventh, eighth round. Book it. I'll take him in every draft right now. Him and Russell Gage. That's right. Hi. <laughs> Another guy that we just consistently are just like, well, it's got to happen sometime, right? It's the Derrick Henry, you know, Tom Brady is the Derrick Henry of quarterbacks where it's like the, it's got to catch up with him sometime, right? It's got to happen soon. I, I will believe it when I see it. I will, I will believe the drop off when I see it from Tom Brady. Otherwise I will continue to rank him very aggressively. I like the call there for me. I mentioned an obvious name. I'll go with Trey Lance, man. Mm -hmm. Trey Lance as that breakout quarterback this year. Uh, Lance started two games last season for the 49ers week 17 against Houston week five against Arizona in week 17. He finishes the QB 10 with 20.06 fantasy points. Okay. In week five, he finished as the QB 20, but we need to remember that he was stopped at the literal inch line from scoring a rushing touchdown on fourth down. If he had scored that, it would have been enough to vault him up to QB 12 on the week. So we're looking at even a very, very small sample size in his rookie season, you know, going from North Dakota State to the NFL in those two opportunities because of just his skill set. He was a top 12 quarterback minimum, right? That was his floor. Mm -hmm. Then we get a full offseason of him prepping as a starter. We're seeing a ton of positive hype coming out about Trey Lance, an offensive, an offense loaded with playmakers, creative play calling, and he averaged, averaged 12 rush attempts in each of those two games. So we're getting the potential of what he can be with his with his arm, his cannon of an arm. If he can throw for 25 touchdowns and then Add on the rush attempts with the rushing touchdowns, his usage in the red zone, right? Because we saw that last year, they were bringing him in uh, to be that read option guy in the in the red zone to be able to kind of wear the defense down. He has that skill set to score six plus rushing touchdowns each season. We got a potential league winner here, and we're getting him in the at the QB nine, QB ten range. That is a guy that I absolutely think is going to step forward in a massive way this year. I've been a Trey Lance supporter, obviously. Adam has QB one over Trevor Lawrence coming out of that class. Uh, loved Trey Lance and his skill set and what he could be for fantasy football. I think this is the year that we finally see it happening, and I think he has the potential to break fantasy football this season. All right. Murph, thank you so much, man. Thank you so much for taking some time out here to come onto the podcast, talk about some breakout wide receivers and quarterbacks. Greatly appreciate your insight. Why don't you let everyone know what you got going on with the book coming out here with the five-yard rush? What do you got coming up? Well, uh, I really appreciate uh, again, the invite to come on and it's always great talking with you. Uh, you know, I've had great fun over the years um, talking with you on some of your shows. You've been on my show. We need to get you back on at some point as well. Um, the book is the fantasy football playbook. Uh, it's in its third year, but this one I think is uh, the most complete year yet in terms of a lot of the strategy, not just strategy pre-draft, but a lot of in-season strategy guys, how to manage your fab, how to structure your benches, when to pick up those handcuffs, when to drop those handcuffs, when to take some shots. You know, there's a lot of stuff in there along with some metrics that will get you to view the game a little bit differently and just give you that edge over the rest of your league. So that will hopefully be out on Amazon, I'm hoping, next week. Um, so hopefully by, you know, maybe the 23rd or the 25th at some point uh, it should be out. It's it's pretty much done. We just got to send it to Amazon, some final formatting tweaks, but it's exciting. Five year rush is just getting stronger and stronger. We just had episode 600, which That's is crazy, which awesome. is mad. <laughs> um, so we've had some amazing people on. We got a whole suite of podcasts. So there's the flagship with me and my co-host, Dan There's the dynasty podcast uh, with Liam and rich college podcast. 
uh, with Stocks and Ash and the rest of the team there. We've also got IDP. We've got a new podcast, Blitz, coming uh, in season, which is going to be a lot of fun as well. So uh, we've got every every scoring format. We're going to have DFS back again this year. So much going on. Load of great writers. I think we've brought on board like 15 writers. So a lot of content on awesome. fiberrush.co.uk. And you can catch any work that I do on Fantasy Pros as well. I do write for them and uh, just written some uh, cool guides for guillotine leagues, vampire leagues, and uh, some value-based drafting strategy. So you can catch all of that at Fantasy Pros along with my ranks. And of course, follow him at Murph underscore NFL on Twitter. Murph, thank you so much again for taking some time out. All right, remember, you can check out the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the fantasy playbook. Hit the like button on this video if you are watching. Subscribe to the channel. Let's get to 5,000 YouTube subscribers here. We are about to kick it into high gear leading into the fantasy football season. I'm so excited to see where this goes. All right, thank you so much for listening. For Adam Murphy, I'm Kyle Yates, and we'll see you next time.